Come on now. Come on now. Are you guys pumped? Are you ready to go? I hope so. Because right now it is 10 p.m. Kaiser Standard Time. Monday, June 13th. And you are tuned in to your boy, Jeremiah Bannister, the one and only paleocrat, the Kaiser of the Wolfpack Chat. And this is Paleocrat Diaries. <laughs> I hope you're super psyched. I hope you're beyond sight. And why? Because tonight is the night that the Lord has made. This is a special Evening Emperor edition of the show. We had to do it. We had to do it. Why? Because sometimes you've got errands to run. Sometimes you've got things to do. And sometimes you have roofers (laughs) working on the roof. You got folks working on the roof, building up the castle. Right? Castle Paleocrat here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We're really grateful for those guys. Totally true, totally true. And I'm really grateful for you because today you're gonna be joining me in going through mystics and messiahs, cults and new religions in American history. But first, what do we do? I hope you've already done it. I hope you did it right from the get-go, right from the start of your day, because that's when you gotta do it. That's when you gotta do it, taking a knee for Christ the King, right? Making your life, all your thoughts and words and deeds in conformity with the divine constitution of the visible church. (laughs) That's how we roll, right? Because we're not disobedient children. We're not agitating all the time, looking for scandals and sensational things to chase after, like ambulance chasers. It's not what we're doing. It's not what we're doing. Instead, we're going into the octagon. We're going to the octagon of history, and we're showing you how you can understand what people believe, why they believe what they believe, and why we think it's hogwash, and how we can communicate that, (laughs) right, effectively and resolving deep inside for the remainder of our lives to never give up, to keep on smiling, and to remember that we too, one day, we're gonna die. We don't know how it's gonna happen. Not entirely sure. I have a feeling right now that things aren't looking too hot for your boy because my wife did not get me some coffee. (laughs) And I got all the kids here. They've let me down. They have let me down so badly. I hope they're tuned in right now experiencing enormous amounts of shame, scrambling around to the best of their ability. It's why I feel like I have no energy. (laughs) I do, I feel like I'm just like whooped. I'm beat, right? My day is coming down to the end. But then I think to myself and I say, this is an Evening Emperor edition of the show. I love these, by the way. I do, I think we ought to do them more often. Might need to talk to Mr. Lofton and find out if we can do this on the regular maybe, right? This one. I'd still do, I'd still do, you know, the, the uh, Wednesday and Friday shows, probably keep those where they are. But this week, just to let you know ahead of time, real quickly, uh, that we're going to have a number of shows available for you. Uh, for one, there's going to be two, not just one, but two episodes in the Fat Shame to Fitness private chat over on Telegram. If you're a fat slob, <laughs> and if you're an American, you probably are, I'm mean, not going to lie. You probably are a grotesque fat slob. <laughs> and, and you've been pounding down way too much food down that esophagus for a long time. And maybe you've done all these restrictive things, all these crazy schemes, liquid diets, right? Making sure you ain't eating no carbs. Making sure you're not eating anything but meat. Not even, not even seasonings and stuff. And you're going through all of these different, very restrictive diets. Maybe you're doing intermittent fasting. You're to the point you're so fat that you've decided that you're going to do 20 hours. <laughs> you're like, you're like, I'm not going to eat for 20 hours. I'm going to really try. And you fail, right? You get down on yourself or you say, I'm going to the gym. I'm going to start doing a gym membership every single day. And I'm going to go and I'm going to work out for an hour, an hour and a half. And you're going to just, just hang that albatross of your weight all over the neck of your exercise. Okay. If you're sick of that routine and you've been on that pendulum, swinging on that pendulum until you're blue in the face, you should join the Fat Shame to Fitness program. It's really easy. You eat until you are, you eat when you're hungry, but only when you're physically hungry. You only eat until you're full. You can eat anything you want, for real. And in fact, I showed this, I demonstrated it on the, on the chat. I started with ice cream. I did. Been losing weight like mad. Been losing weight like mad. And that's not to say, it's not to say that everybody should be sitting around eating a bunch of ice cream, okay? <laughs> but simply saying that, I'm trying to demonstrate the bare minimum of what you need to do in order to get your life back under control. And we're going to be doing two episodes this week over there, live chats. The last two have been awesome. Uh, how do you know when you're, when you're hungry? The lies we tell ourselves, right? Stuff like that. And, uh, 
Well, I thought my kids were coming in with that, with the drink. <laughs> I don't think they are. Where's my coffee? <laughs> You're killing me. Oh, you know, but the thing is, <laughs> you got to switch gears like so fast. Um, you know, it, the thing is, is that to know when you're hungry, to know when you're full. What does it mean to be full? What does it mean to be hungry? And what do you do in the meantime? For us, we pray. And if we're ever, if we're ever concerned, oh, and look at this. Oh, she brought me. And this is, this is we're, we decide we're going to do some proof. Oh, yes. Look at this. Okay. So just to let everybody know, first of all, I eat off of small plates now. Pizza. Okay. I'm showing you what I do for real. For real. And do we have any juice? Have the kids come. And then right here, mint chocolate chip ice cream. And we're going to chill out. I've got these two delicious things. My favorite ice cream in one of my favorite foods in the world sitting right in front of me. It smells amazing. It looks amazing. And I'm chilled out. Okay. You got to just be chill. And you got to take some sips. We, we talk about that in the chat. So that's one thing. Number two, I'm going to be doing some uh, videos over at Paleocrat. You got to make sure to go over there. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to do a series on uh, nihilism. Okay. So we're going to be going through a book about that. It's going to be totally awesome. Uh, apologetics and dealing with the history of it, the development of it, uh, why it's garbage, why it's dangerous, why it's a cesspool in an abyss. We're going to talk about that. That's going to be on Paleocrat's YouTube channel. Uh, I think the I think the mention is in the description below. You can just click on it. Make sure to subscribe for sure. Um, and go through. You have a whole catalog over there. It's awesome. There's a whole bunch of playlists, a whole bunch of awesome stuff. And on top of that, uh, Jake Fowler, right? He's going. The two of us are joining forces, right? Wonder Twins. We've got our <laughs> Wonder Twin powers unite kind of thing going on. And we're going to do an episode over there. And that's going to be on Friday. That'll be a live uh, live stream over there. And we're going to be talking about. Uh, the position that the apostle takes regarding public debates, okay, and why we take the position that we do on that. Because we talk about apologetics, and people are like, well, why aren't you out there doing debates? I do something similar to them. I've done dialogues. You may have seen the one I did with Tim Flanders on the Mass of the Ages. I'm trying to, I'm trying to hit up Cameron O'Hearn. I got to hit that cat up. He reached out to me in a, in a, a private chat underneath a, a private video on YouTube between myself and Tim talking about Mass of the Ages and our disagreements on that, my concerns and my criticisms of it. And he was kind enough to reach out. A charitable dude. Charitable dude. And I'd love to, I'd love to talk to him. And it, there's a possibility that uh, River, uh, River Run and myself that we'll be speaking with the co-producer of the film in a separate video. So there's a whole bunch. And if you want to keep up with all that, go to the Wolfpack chat. That is in the description below. Real quick, before we move on, last thing. Last thing, I want to go ahead and, uh, and actually, you know what, we'll go ahead and do the same maker first. Let's do the same maker first. That way you can go and get your coffee. My kids can get their rear ends in gear, <laughs> get their rear ends in gear and bring in my, my juice. I need some juice. So I don't just drink coffee. I also drink juice. I don't even have a straw. <laughs> what is happening here? Yeah, what's happening here? Oh, see, they made my wife do it. No, just, I just did it. You just did it. They have headphones. Hey, hey, get over here, woman. Get over here, woman. <laughs> yeah, come on now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I love you, baby. Yeah. Mega hot, half Korean beauty queen wife. Everybody who watches the show, you know it. <laughs> you know it. Speaking of another thing you know, same maker. You got to check it out. You got to look at it. It speaks for itself. You're going to see the promo here in about mm, 10 seconds. But you really got to get into it, right? It's something some people... They're not able to. There's difficulties with it. Sometimes they're like, it's not their spirituality. That was Tim Flanders, for example. Uh, for others like myself and others you'll hear about uh, in the ad, the promo, uh, it does fit theirs. And it's changed their lives, right? It's, it's been incorporated into the megazord of their apostolates, right? The megazord, all the different things that these people do. And I'll tell you, right, if you knew my day today, right, even starting this morning at four in the morning, I was on Terror of Demons if you want to check that out, we were talking about pro-life issues. You can go check that out. And uh, it's, of course, in playlists and everything else. And so, but if you if you understood how my day went, right, and what, what this kind of work entails, I can't even imagine what, what Lofton deals with. I can't. That guy's on another level. Same thing with Flanders, on another level. I have mad respect for him. But I'm working my way up. I'm, I'm working my way up, moving on up, upward and onward all the time. That's how we roll. 
And one of the things, one of the key ingredients that's made sense of that has been this idea that you can plan your day and plan your week and your month and your year. In fact, plan out even further than that. And to do so with Christ at the center. To do so with Christ at the center. And the way that that happens, we'll talk about it right now. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself. But in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction. And our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough. And most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion because that can help you become a saint. The saint maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited, though. So head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. It's as easy as the www on the screen, thesaintmaker.com slash Diaries. You can find the promo in the description below. Right now, though, right now, I hope you got that coffee. I do, finally, straight to the dome. Mm. Bypassing the blood-brain barrier. <laughs> totally true totally true scientifically verified scientifically verified do you want to know what else is scientifically verified apparently the paleocrat has been crowned the holy roman emperor by the kyline c is it kyline or kyline kyline sounds a little girly i don't think that's right (laughs) but either which way by your marxlancy kyle marx i appreciate it brother but right now we're going to be entering the octagon of history talking about mystics and messiahs cults and new religions in American history. America's got this crazy love affair. You can see it all around. You may not have actually noticed. You may not have noticed because it's subtle. It's sly. Enthusiasm's always us. It's true. And that's what we talk about. That's what we've gone through, beginning with Ronald Knox. We went through his magnum opus, Enthusiasm, right? A chapter in the history of the church. Powerful, powerful series. Powerful, powerful book. But that led on and said, look, He ended at a certain time. What are we gonna do? It's not as if cults and enthusiasms, heresies and sects, all of a sudden just, you know, stop. (laughs) We had to deal with it. So we decided we're gonna pick up where he left off. We're gonna give it our best. Give it everything we've got. And we're gonna march forward, resolving inside every thought, word and deed, Christ the King. That we're going to be equipped with that kind of, that deep resolution of faith that's unwavering that believes these and all the other truths, not some, not every once in a while, we do not embrace the line item veto pen. There's no such thing in our system. There are certain folks that don't like that. They don't like that. They like the line item veto pen. (laughs) Give me my pen back. And I'm like, nope, nope. That's what gives strength and force, power, right? Resilience to the idea that we never give up, that we keep on smiling and that we remember that we too one day shall die. We're not looking at life through a monocle. We're not looking through the monocle at the faith and saying, I can see this, but not that. I'm gonna submit to this, but not that. No, no, no. We are we are rocking and rolling. We're rocking and rolling on that pillar and foundation of truth that provides the framework, right? Wherein we live and move and have our being. It is a powerful, powerful deal being a Catholic. I gotta tell you, that's just the truth. <laughs> it's just the truth. Ah, speaking of just the truth, I gotta, gotta throw these guys up. Look at this. Look at this. Ah, what's going on with these folks? Let's find out. Oh, yeah, right from the beginning, right from the get go. Uh, yeah, Brick says, way to be. Oh, so the first one today was Louis. Dude, bro, gonna listen to this while I work out in my living room. Homie, 
That is, yes, I agree with Brig. That is the way to be, brother man. That is the way to be. Are you trying to lose some of that fat, dude? Are you a fat slob? <laughs> I, don't, I never envisioned you as a fat slob, bro. But hey, maybe that's why you're not, because you're actually exercising. <laughs> you're one of those people, I guess, exercising and such, staying fit. Yeah, um, very grateful, of course, all of the love. Very grateful for all of you. Yes, Phil, Brick, Alexander, thank you very much for all of that. Of course, if you throw those wolves, the coffee, and the ice cream cone, you got to do it, man. You got it in the whale, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Swoosh says, give it, uh, give it us, Kaizu. I'm going to. I will give it you. <laughs> I will definitely, definitely give it you. Let's see. Paleo karate. Okay. Uh, why question cake? I do not. That's ridiculous. I thought you wanted food. I do want food, and you brought food. You did a fantastic job. You are an amazing wife. I absolutely love you with all of my heart. And that's dead serious, right? That's You know it, too, girl. You know it. So, Enslaved by Truth. He's got a whole bunch of stuff on there. I don't even know where he gets these. <laughs> where do you get that? Some of these symbols, man. What, what is this? You got the bat phone up in there. He's just got a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see. If you're in the fat chain group, you know it's true. You know. Yes, man. Yes. So here we go. Pilocrat doing an evening show. Better believe it. Coming in with coffee and food. Wish me luck. I don't drop stuff. You did not. You did not. You just dropped some deliciousness on this table for your boy. That's all that was. Let's see here. Michael Lofton fast for 20 hours or so. So does Jimmy Aiken. Uh, yeah, I'd say, you know, I, I don't know about Jimmy Aiken's weight. I know, you know, Lofton, he's got a little bit. He could he could benefit from the Fat Shame for Fitness program. I know the guy who heads it up. <laughs> I love you, Michael. You're an awesome guy, bro. <laughs> he, but he ain't going to give up. He ain't going to give up his Chick-fil-A. He ain't going to give it up. Well, and you know what? He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. He's probably heard all his life. You got to get rid of that Chick-fil-A, homie. And I'm saying, dude, eat those fries. <laughs> Just don't eat so many of them. Don't shove it down your esophagus. I know it's tough. Chick-fil-A. It is tough. No, no, <laughs> no question about that. No question about it. Let's see. I had peppers for dinner. Do not even remind me. If you missed it, by the way, if you missed it, I ate a, uh, I ate a pepper. Not just a pepper. I didn't eat a pepper. I, uh, it was a chip that was completely coated with Carolina Reaper. <laughs> I did not realize. I knew it'd be hot. I'd seen it. I did not know I would be crying like a baby. <laughs> it's all recorded. <laughs> it's all recorded. I know they're going to make a fun video out of it. It's going to be a ton of fun. But we, we did a, a stream because we, we reached a threshold. It was awesome, right? Both on my Paleocrat channel on Telegram as well as the Wolfpack chat on Telegram. And we streamed a movie about this cult. This dude thinks he's the Messiah. Got in trouble with some ladies and such, right? Because, you know, like a lot of these Messiahs, especially for some reason the Seventh Day Adventist groups, they end up hooking up fat with a bunch of chicks. <laughs> That's just what they do. That's just what they do. Let's see. Jacob says, Jeremiah, your intros get me so pumped up. It's true, buddy. Gets me pumped up too, man. Gets me pumped up too. Very grateful for all of you. Yes. Uh, Jeremiah is actually seven foot, and those are normal sized plates. I'm seven foot when I'm seated atop the horse. <laughs> that's what that's what I am. I'm Napoleon, bro. I'm Napoleon. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Fun fact: a lot of times you think you're hungry, but you're actually thirsty. So the next time you're hungry, drink water instead. And we would only add, Lewis, over at the Fat Shame for Fitness program, that whenever you feel hungry but you're not physically hungry, that's a cue from the Lord to pray. And if it's not, it's a good excuse to pray anyway. And so people are praying more than ever, right? They're doing this program. They're praying like crazy, constantly, all the time, because they're constantly, they're magnetized, right? There's a tractor beam to that refrigerator in that pantry, looking aimlessly, wondering what they can shove down their esophagus. They got to pray, right? They got to lift it up to the Lord, and that's what they do. And look, I, have, I still, you know what I'm going to do right now, before we even move on to the book, because we've gone a little bit. That's okay. That's all right. Now, see this? I'm starting with the ice cream. Check it out, okay? Ice cream. Losing weight, losing weight in your face, <laughs> in your face. I dare you to do this. I dare you. Yeah, and I'll take a drink because I put down the I put down the the ice cream. I even have cookies in here, man. I have cookies. In here. I'm strong. I got pork rinds, cookies, pizza. I'm surrounded by food, and I'm chilled out. Thank God, dude. God is awesome. Let's see. 
Let's see here. My cat's laying down next to me. Dude, that's, that is a royal thing, dude. <laughs> that is a royal thing. Yeah. So, all right, there's a whole bunch of these comments. <clears throat> make sure make sure that uh, if you would like to connect with me during the show and you want me to read something in particular, you got to make sure to put the at symbol, okay? Put the at symbol at Paleocrat, okay? And that way I'll be able to see it kind of like up here. See this? I'll do push-ups every time Paleocrat says... Poo poo trash. <laughs> That's not poo poo trash. You should record it, man, because now I'm gonna have to say poo poo trash. We're gonna be talking about poo poo trash. I think that's four poo poo trashes. That's five. <laughs> five push ups, homie. Five push ups. You gotta do it. Look at this. It's crazy. Don't forget your drink today. Yes, I took a drink, but it set it down. That's the rule. So, okay, moving on. Moving on. Let's get this off the screen. Let's get it off the screen. And yes, I can see that. It says paleocrat testing. Yes, I can see it real good. Right here. Did you guys take your pre sup? You talking about? <laughs> yeah, bro, I got you. dude. That's clever, homie. That wins. Dominic Price wins for the day. In fact, dude, if you go over to the Wolfpack chat, I'm dead serious. If you go over to the Wolfpack chat and you go in there and you take a screenshot of that and you post that in there and tag me in it, I'm dead serious. Just Wolfpack chat screenshot tag me. Okay. If you do that, I will I will send you a free book. Okay, I've got a whole bunch here, man. Got a whole bunch here. So okay. We're gonna go back here. We talked last time. I don't know if you if you uh saw this, but we talked last time about um what did we talk about? What did we talk about? A nation of Islam. We talked about the black gods, the black messiahs. We talked about the history of that and what led to that. We actually skipped ahead. So in the, in the live show, we skipped ahead a little bit, whereas when this gets posted in the catalog, it will be backtracked. We'll drop it down, right? So it'll be in the proper order of things. We have catalogs for all the series. Those are available, of course, on our Telegram Wolfpack chat. Um, but right here, it's talking about um, the First World War, right? First World War, you have, you have numerous things going on with that because passionate hopes and fears aroused by the conflict, were expressed in countless tales of visions, prophecies, and miracles on a scale not witnessed since the Thirty Years' War. The war revived spiritualism as newly bereaved families sought contact with their dead. So you, you go through this time, right? You lose family members. You lose family. And, and you go through this terrible trying time. It's super scary. The whole world is at war. It's apocalyptic. But you make it through. But you make it through with major time losses, right? People who've died. And individuals in their, in their sadness and in their despair go to lengths that they ought not dare, right? They do things that they ought not. And one of those things is to engage in spiritualism, right? Trying to connect with the dead, having mediums. The 1920s marked the height of popularity of secret societies like, for example, the Freemasons. Right? I already know we're going to get a simple thing at the bottom, a little thing at the bottom, directing people to go and, and learn about that a little deeper. I'd encourage you also to, to do that. You can start with uh, papal encyclicals. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually serious about that. Yeah, don't, uh, you don't even need to worry about Wikipedia, man. Go to, go to papal encyclicals. I think it's a dot .net. They got a lot of information about that. It's definitely much better than old Wikipedia. It's true. Any serious investigation of the Masonic tradition would soon lead to the, curi uh, the curious to the extensive and often reprinted works of Albert, Albert Pike from the 1870s with his esoteric and Gnostic interpretations of Freemasonry. It might also bring the seeker to Hargrave Jennings' book, The Rosicrucians, and thence to the corpus of literature that had originally inspired the, uh, the Theosophist, right? So in this place, you're saying, look at the connection. Look at the way they work. It's like those Duplo blocks. That you, you can put in a little train. You got like an engine. You got your caboose. They get together. They hook up. It's kind of what happened with these. <laughs> Basically the same thing. Freemasonry opened an enticing doorway to the wider occult world. Masonic precedents also assisted the growth of other traditions, such as a name that I will not mention, except that they wear really weird white outfits with pointy hats. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want the algorithm to be like, oh my gosh, he's mentioning Freemasons and he's mentioning the group over there. <laughs> he's mentioning both. 
What's next? You know, Uncle Mustache Man? <laughs> What's this book trying to do to me? It's a scholarly work, YouTube. Don't bust my chops. Don't bust my chops on me, okay? But in order to appeal to the Masons and other fraternal organizations, the white cladded people, <laughs> you know who, those folks adopted a rich mythology and a heraldry with all the mystique implied by its hierarchy of, quote, hydras, great titans, furies, giants, exalted cyclops, and terrors. <laughs> hey, what are weirdos? These guys are straight up LARPing, by the way. Isn't it just straight LARP? Isn't it? I think so. I think so. It's like right out of a, a, I would say it's out of a, you know, some kind of a Ren Fest or something, but I don't want to dog Ren Fest. They're pretty decent, actually. <laughs> Medieval festivals, Renaissance fairs. These guys, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Every time I think of these cats, I always think of that one video where they're, 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 there's like 10 of them, right? And they're walking down the street all frumpy and such. And some guy is behind him with a tuba. <laughs> Dude, it's hilarious. Oh, man, that's hilarious. It had a distinctive secret language, elaborate system of signs and counter signs. So they were trying to woo the other weirdos. They're trying to woo the other esoteric magicians. <laughs> no black magicians still. All right, we're still in that day and age. <laughs> no black magicians for that group, that's for sure. Yeah. Another social development of these years was the changing role and improving status of women. And this is something I want you to think about, right? Because we live kind of in the heyday of the Me Too movement and the ascendance of the feminine, right? Femininity, the, the, the feminine rising. The problem is, uh, it's not very feminine anymore. In fact, it's really difficult for them to even define what that word means. It could include, you know, folks with beards and junk. No. Yeah. For the generation of the 1920s, this meant the suffrage and prohibition. In the 1970s, it would involve sharply increased public awareness of issues of sexual violence. Both decades were also marked by the surging popularity of women-oriented religious ideas and sects. And I think one of the things that you're going to find as this develops is that these had political ramifications. They were always connected, right? It wasn't as if it was just as purely uh, it, it, that their worldview was somehow detached from the world around them. That's why it's a worldview. <laughs> You're stuck with it. You're stuck with it. And so we have the same thing happen now. And what do we have? We have crazy, crazy uh, political ideas, crazy cultural ideas, crazy religious ideas all around all trying to come against the patriarchy. Yeah, come against the patriarchy. We got to tear it down. We got to show those men who's the real boss. In the early part of the century, the groups founded by leaders like Madame Blavatsky, Amy Semple McPherson, uh, Myrtle uh, Fillmore, Ellen White, and Mary Baker Eddy. So you have numerous women at this point, right? You have theosophy, You've got Foursquare Movement. We'll talk about Amy Semple sometimes. She was, she was an odd bird, man. She was a real weirdo. <laughs> Myrtle Fillmore, Ellen White, okay? So Ellen White, I, I'm, from, I'm from Battle Creek, Michigan. We have, a, we, have a, we have a lot of that around us there, right? The, the prophetess of the seventh day. You've got Mary Baker Eddy. That's the Christian science. She's the matriarch, right? Of, of the kind of Christian new age that was going on. The, the Christian... New Thought Metaphysic. Theosophy deserves much of the credit for popularizing yoga and associated Hindu ideas, as well as terms like karma, mahatma, guru, right? And is it chela? I don't know what that would be. Not entirely sure. But guru, mahatma, karma, yoga, no doubt about it. In 1898, the American Theosophical Society fell apart amidst vicious internal squabbles. That's an understatement. Right? They, they were pressing like all the time because the, the idea is that there's these ascended masters, okay? And these masters have ascended and they could go into, you know, experience nirvana, but instead they kind of just stick around and they give us messages. And Blavatsky, she was loaded, her and her boy. She had a buddy, right? And the two of them, they were just getting messages left and right. In fact, there was letters from these ascended masters coming out all over the place, out the wazoo, 
and it became this cult of the ascended master. Well, eventually people started figuring it out that the, the ascended master idea is in fact poo poo, trash, nonsense. <laughs> it's quackadoodle. It's nonsense. Cuckoo bird nonsense. Cuckoo bird crazy pant nonsense. Makes no sense at all. And they're like, I think she's faking it. Uh, what gave you that? <laughs> what, what led you to, to the impression that she was really having these discussions with real ascended masters that were like, I could enter Nirvana, but I'm going to stick around here. I'm going to talk to Blavatsky. Blavatsky? I don't think so. But they got in a big squabble because once people figured it out, she's blaming old boy, old boy's blaming her. They have a major spat. He sees a letter where she's totally ripping on him like crazy, basically saying she owns the dude. He's wrapped around her finger and such. He reads it. He's devastated. They part ways. She ends up getting even more popular, goes off to London. Ends up kind of passing the torch to another popular person over there in England. Hung out with a lot of the, the, the people. Where the, the, the other guy, he was just keeping true to the original mission. One American strand of theosophy was dominated by Catherine Tingley, who in 1899 established her headquarters at Point Loma, her, quote, white city in a land of gold beside a sunset sea. What a weird name, by the way. I, I've heard some long Protestant names of churches. I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard that, right? You have the African United Methodist Episcopal Co you know, uh, Church of God in Christ. You have like all these different ones and they have these long, super dupe long names. Yeah, but white city in a land of gold beside a sunset sea. What a weirdo. Who, who's in that room with old Tingly? And she's like, yeah, I think this is a really good idea. White city in a land of gold beside a sunset sea. And all the guys are like, dang girl, that sounds great. Who's that guy? You got to smack that bugger around. <laughs> Say, dude, that's a bad idea. Thank you. It was great. Yeah, history laughs at you. This became a Xanadu dream world in which 40 buildings represented a spectrum of architectural styles with, quote, Muslim domes, Hindu temples, Egyptian gates, and Greek theaters. It had to be a sight, right? In fact, I, I wish I had a, I wish I had it up right now. I'd be able to see that. I'll share it over at the Wolfpack Chat. Right. Beside theosophy, the main vehicle for esoteric theories was Rosic uh, Rosicrucianism, right? Which had an authentic American history beginning from the time of the 17th century German settlers in Pennsylvania. The Rosicrucian fraternity, the Rosicrucian, Rosicrucian. <laughs> it's, boy, what a, what a weird word. Yeah. I was actually watching a, a, pretty, a pretty decent video on this. I don't know where this church, it had to be a church of some kind. I don't know where it was from. But the guy, the guy teaching up in the front, he's doing a series on cults. I actually wanted to reach out to him. I saw this weird sparkle under his nose. I think he had one of his, his septum piercers or something. <laughs> I was like, wait, really? Yeah. Oh, it actually reminded me. I hit the plate. Check it out. Yeah. Mukbangin. <laughs> Mukbangin on the Evening Emperor Edition. Oh, no. That pizza is so good. Mm. But here's the thing. Pascal B. Randolph, right, was originally a spiritualist medium. So this guy, it's Cap. He's sitting there. He's doing his thing, connecting with the ghosts, with the spirits. After extensive travels in Europe, Randolph developed a complex occult system that incorporated sexual magic. Wow. And you saw oh, hashish. <laughs> this guy's like, oh, dude, hey. Isn't that a pitch, though, right? To a, a really degenerate society. Just imagine how degenerate you got to be for that. Just imagine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, talking about, you guys has been replaced these days by mindfulness meditation. Bro, you're onto something with that, I think, buddy. Yeah, for real. You know, it's one of those things, like, I get being mindful. We call it mental prayer. There's a way to do it. But you follow these things where it's like, you got to envision. 
And, and look, people can say, well, don't you have like a nation ideas about that? And you're like, yes, we're not quietists, right? It's a subtle thing, right? They, they use this kind of language sometimes. Somebody was even talking about Scientology when we were talking about that, saying that there are certain ideas regarding the engram that is a lot like the, the certain things in, in Thomism. Sly. But incorporating sex magic, sexual magic, and using some hashish, right? <laughs> like, yeah, uh, you want to join our cult? And you're like, what are you doing? And you're like, look at me. And you're like, what are you doing? I, I'm engaged in sexual magic, and I'm smoking some hashish. <laughs> you're like, dang, son. That's quite a pitch, quite a sales pitch for your cult. And that's to alter your conscience. Consciousness, yeah. 1902, R. Swinburne Clymer of Quakertown, Pennsylvania, I've been there, publishes his history of the Rosicrucian movement. Shortly afterward, he founded his own Rosicrucian fraternity, complete with a hierarchy of Masonic-sounding titles. Below the Imperialistic Council, and the venerable order of the Magi. <laughs> so, so he create again, do these guys are like straight up LARPing. These guys are, are live action role play, big time. These guys are Dungeon and Dragons this thing up. That's what's happening here. The imperialistic council and the venerable order of the Magi. Imagine if you're like, what are you dressed up for? I'm part of the venerable order of the Magi. And I'd be like, oh, is that down at that game store where you guys roll dice and such? <laughs> what's up with that? These were the degrees of the priests of Melchizedek. There it is again. And the Knights of Chivalry and Order of the Holy Grail. In 1915, H. Spencer Lewis founded the ancient and mystical order, right? Rosicrucius, the Amarch, A-M-O-R-C. He borrowed extensively, of course, from Theosophy and Golden Dawn. As if it couldn't get worse than Theosophy. <laughs> it's like, oh, what are your influence? Oh, theosophy. And you're like, ugh, ugh. you get like that gag reflex in the back of your throat a little bit. <laughs> you know, when you eat too fast and some of it kind of indigestion comes up and it kind of, it tastes like really burned orange juice in the back of your throat. This is really traumatic scarring event and you hate every second of it. And then he mentions Golden Dawn and you're like, ugh. it's like in your mouth now. Straight up chunk, like all, all of the predictable stuff, like, Fruit Loops, Jolly Ranchers, Cheerios, Pineapple. The stuff that's in there every time and you don't know when because you really don't eat that stuff. <laughs> that's basically what's happening. Heindel's Rosicrucian Christianity included the sections Astronomical Allegories of the Bible, The Mystery of the Holy Grail, The Coming Force, Vril or What? And of course, The Angels as Factors in Evolution. Yeah. 1920s, Evangeline Adams of Boston became America's first astrological superstar. So it's actually not that long ago, 1920. 1920s is when you started having the superstars coming up. All right? Telling tell the future based on the stars. Yeah, I, you know, I saw, I saw it one time. It was not long ago, actually. I was on this site. And it, it was right there, right? And it was like, oh, Aries. And I'm like, oh, what, what's that say? And I looked, I'm like, this is such garbage. Like, who's writing these? <laughs> It's a guy who was fired from Hallmark. In the scholarly text from Ritual to Romance, 1920, Jesse L. Weston traced the medieval Holy Grail myth back to an ancient fertility rite. Ding boy! Ding boy! He's over there with Ishtar and stuff. That's probably what he's up to. <laughs> he's getting down with Ishtar. Ugh. Weston's theories and the associated tarot imagery were popularized by T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, perhaps the best-known English poem of the 20th century. Meanwhile, tales of the lost continents not only flourished, they proliferated. Now, I was I somebody in the chat was saying that Atlantis is in fact, or uh, Atlantis is not in fact, um, a continent, right? And so they said, just as a side note, so I'm like, ah, oh, we'll trust him on that. We'll trust him on that. And I see Germanicus, what you wrote about <laughs> too many guys who, you know, they got, it rhymes with, you know, gimp <laughs> in those cults. Yeah, man. Oh. Yeah, let's see here. 
Let's see. The whole alternate history and archaeology of the human civilization, venturing many thousands of years before the meager period marked out by staid academics. The ancient civilization of Atlantis, the lost land of Lemuria, said to lie under the Indian Ocean and to have left traces throughout the Pacific world. Historical accounts of this lost society were mainly derived from mediumship and channeling. She go, oh, you got you got the the uh, Lemurians here, and you go, okay, so uh, you know, tell me about that civilization, and they're like, oh, we've got a lot of details, and you're like, dang, girl, you know, dang, dude, you guys have a lot of these details. What kind of archaeological finds did you do? And they're like, uh, we were digging deep, deep in the soil of the spirit realm. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, we were digging deep. We, we struck we struck gold. And you're like, you did? You got gold like a mine? Oh, we mined really good. And we found ourselves an ascended master. Ghosts that told us the real stories. What a bunch of... And look, what do you do with competing situations? Oh, no. That's not how it really went down. I've got the real truth. Oh, yeah. You don't have the real truth. I do. Oh, I don't think so. No. Nope. They really spoke to me. No way, they spoke to me. You just go forever and ever and ever. These people catfighting, pulling each other's hair and so. How would it be resolved? Go back to the master. That's what I said to do. <laughs> you know, ad infinitum, right? Ad nauseum. <clears throat> round and round and round you go. Manly Hall. The hypnotist who in 19... 19- 36 founded the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles. In 1928, he published his encyclopedic outline of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian symbolical philosophy. Not surprising, it was a portrait of guess who? If you had to guess, right? You gotta cue that, you gotta cue that music, right? That that Jeopardy tune. I'll give you like three seconds. Here we go. It's St. Germain. I'm not even going to waste time. <laughs> it's St. Germain, dude. And they're like, oh, of course. Obviously, St. Germain, that guy. Yeah, the guy nobody even really knows existed and definitely had fake magic powers and junk. Fake esoteric knowledge. Phone balloons. Homer Curtis began in 1909 with his Letters from the Teacher, a book that purported to be channeled or, in fact, more precisely, quote, transmitted by Ramia, priestess of the flame. This kind of thing, this kind of thing reminds me, right? If, if you if you imagined a book that said that it was Ramia, priestess of the flame, if you thought of that, would that be one of those books that your you know moms in the eighties used to buy that were kind of inappropriate, but it had pictures of Fabio on the cover? <laughs> yeah, Ramia. Priestess of the Flame. And you're like, oh, that's so hot. Fabio's on the cover of that one. Uh, no, that's that's not Fabio. That's actually St. Germain. Well, I didn't know St. Germain was so buff. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, hold on. I gotta eat a little bit more ice cream. It's melting in front of my face, so I gotta eat it, okay? Mmm. But do you see what's happening here? Do you see the chill? See how calm it is? Fat shame to fitness. You got to do it. Losing weight. The Curtis books were highly eclectic. Dabbling in Masonic symbols. The Trinity. The Elohim. Angels. Mythology. Evolution. Cycles. Right? What is this? Initiations. Etc. So he puts out this book. It's got a whole bunch of this stuff. It's, it's all, it's, it's encyclopedia, okay? It's an encyclopedia of this, letting you know all of the cuckoo crazy in a one-stop shop. We can take the key of destiny as typical of the elusive methodology and broad scope that characterized the writing of the Curtises, as well as Manley P. Hall and the Curtises' many New Age colleagues. It also indicates the remarkably self-contained world of occult thought with its own distinctive Logic, right? 
The book presents a system of number mysticism. This is I mentioned this before. I didn't realize that we were going to talk about it the very next show. I thought we already talked about it. We did not. But I but I read it. This is powerful, guys. This is this is right up out of Bible code. This is right up out of out of the the Thief in the Night series with those really big diagrams of the end times. It's right out of that. Right out of National Enquirer, right off the pages, right? Hot off the press. Extra, extra, read all the cuckoo nonsense. The book presents a system of number mysticism that draws on correspondences between numbers, Hebrew, letters, zodiac signs, and the greater trumps of the tarot deck. And they cite such diverse sources as the apocryphal book of Enoch and Lighten's Zanoni. For example, some 50 pages, just imagine this, 50 pages are devoted to discussing the significance of what? The number 15. <laughs> the number. 50 pages are dedicated to the number 15. And what did they have to say? What was it? A very powerful number. And one that is very little understood. Yes! Magical insights. Powerful. Imagine trying to pitch that to somebody. I get you know, I get pinch, uh, pinching. <laughs> I get pitching the sexual magic and the hashish. I understand the logic of that. But the logic of this? Very powerful number. One that's very little understood. People are like, 50 pages? Uh, really? It better be the best. Oh, believe me, it is. It is number one. Oh, this is like the most dope thing you've ever read. <laughs> Uh, about the number 15? Yes! Obviously! Their investigation drew on Kabbalistic methods, noting that the number 15 corresponds to the Hebrew letter Samek, which in turn is connected to the zodiac sign, Sagittarius, and the greater trump known as what? The devil! <laughs> After a lengthy meditation, the Curtises conclude that the number has a profound message for the believer. And what is that profound message at the tail end? The crescendo, okay? You've reached, the, you've reached the pinnacle. You've reached the heights. It's the coda of those 50 pages. Quote, embrace, by the way, buckle in. The pure Christ light is beginning to shine within him like the sun rising on a new day. What? <laughs> what the heck is that? 50 pages? I would burn that. I would rip it up. Well, first of all, I would take something very sharp, but not too sharp. I would want to enjoy myself. So maybe something like the edge of a butter knife, like the serrated edges that are just sharp, sharp enough that you rub it and you wonder if it might cut you, but part of you knows it won't. I would take that and I would rub it really hard for a while until it was kind of scuffed up. And then from there, I would just chop it up like crazy. Ah, cha, cha, cha. I'd chop it up. I'd break out my, my size, my ninja size. And I'd be going to town on that bugger, poking holes, quick, 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 doing that. Ripping it into pieces, putting it in a shredder, lighting it on fire, taking the ashes, and then throwing it into the water. And then taking the water and flushing it down the toilet. That's <laughs> what I would do. The whole book, I'd say, I'm done. I'm done. 50 pages, and the best you've got is the pure Christ light is beginning to shine within him like the sun rising on a new day. <laughs> All of that from the number 15. Wow, thanks for wasting my time. The upsurge of occult speculation was well fitted to the Aquarian age. You may, you may be familiar with this from the philosophers who were involved in the fifth dimension. That was a song, by the way. <laughs> it was a song. The dawning of the age of Aquarius. It's actually one of my favorite oldies songs. I'm not going to lie. I loved it since I was a kid. Kind of like, what, what, what is it? Uh, Under My Umbrella? Or... or uh, Away in a Beautiful Balloon. What's the name of that song? I haven't listened to him in a long time, but I used to love that song. 
in my beautiful balloon. Yeah. The term requires explanation. During different historical eras, the sun is located in different houses of the zodiac, each of which is believed by astrologers to determine the character of those centuries under its influence. Are you already starting your, your spidey senses? Are they starting to go off a little eats bits? Are they? Does this sound familiar to you? Does it, does it sound like something that for like half a nanosecond had me whipped until I realized how stupid it was? One of the more embarrassing admissions of my life. Don't let me forget it. I mean, don't let me forget. I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I mean, you know. When the dominant sign was Taurus around 1500 BC, this constellation controlled the ancient era of bull cults and bull sacrifice. Near the birth of Jesus, the sun entered the sign of Pisces, and the next 2,000 years were dominated by the religion of Christianity, whose earliest symbol was a fish. During the 20th century, the sun would enter a new house, that of Aquarius! And according to occult belief, this event would be marked by a profound new spirituality, a time of mystical enlightenment and enhanced intuition, possibly symbolized by the appearance of a new messianic figure or a particular singing group called the Fifth Dimension. That was in the scrolls. <laughs> it's in the scrolls, boys and girls. Hence the stir over uh, Krishnamurti. Aquarian terminology was popularized by Levi Dowling's book, The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ, an esoteric account of Jesus' life. And again, the fifth dimension. The Aquarian era would also be a new age. Oh, by the way, the, the thing I told you not to let me forget about, and you guys totally let me forget. Do you guys know what that one was? What, what did it remind you of hearing that whole story? I'll give you a circa 2010. Right? Circa 2010. I'll give you another hint. It was a poo-poo trash movie. That was stinky socks level stuff, to be frank. That was your kid's been playing outside for days and hasn't changed his diaper. Kind of gross. Okay? <laughs> outside for days. <laughs> That's your kid, not mine. I would never do that. <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> I'm not speaking from experience. My parents, they, they let me do that <laughs> for days at a time. Uh, sleeping out in the, in the, under the stars, man. That's what it was about, right? I was roughing it as a kid. Yeah, but what is it? Right? Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist. Yeah. So you have Zeitgeist, the movie, the atheist film that people, you know, for like half a second, it persuaded a whole bunch of different people. A movie, Milo and Otis. <laughs> it's not Milo and Otis, man. You can't throw Milo and Otis under the bus like that, dude. They were anti-cult warriors. They're on our side. Especially the cat. <laughs> Especially the cat. And that's not even debatable, okay? <laughs> it's just a fact, okay? This phrase appeared in the 1880s when John Balu Nubro, Nubro claimed to channel a text published by OAHSPE, a New Age Bible. And the usage spread with the dawn of the 20th century. This was also the era of the new woman, the new state, the new thought itself. Aleister Crowley, he dated this new aeon from the channeling of his new scripture, the Book of the Law, in 1904. 1935, Paul Foster Case published a study of the Great Seal of the United States, studying, quote, its history, symbolism, and message for the new age. Don't you see that stuff still, though? That's what I'm saying. You see this stuff to this day. And by the way, Jade, you're asking if that's all linear? It's not a booklet. This is a legit book, okay? It's written by Philip Jenkins, a distinguished professor of history and religious studies at Pennsylvania State University, and the author of Hidden Gospels, How the Quest for Jesus Lost Its Way. But he does a great job on this. Does a great job on this. 
popularity of occult, Asian, and new thought ideas laid the foundation for a new wave of fringe religions. And already you're seeing new wave and new age kind of put together. It's unfortunate because we've thrown Yanni under the bus. It's true. Poor guy. <laughs> I'm serious. I actually really like some of Yanni's songs. I had to leave early from a concert. I was crying so hard. I'm like, oh my gosh. It's Felitza, dude. I, come on. You can't blame me. Felice is a good song. You'd cry too. I know it. <laughs> Don't lie. You probably already have. As early as 1896, we hear grumbling about a wave of new prophets, quote, sent from some great Erephant of the brotherhood, of the motherhood, of the golden candelabra. The brotherhood of the motherhood of the candelabra. What? <laughs> Again, who's coming up with this? Who's marketing that? The brotherhood of the motherhood of the candelabra and everybody in town snickering. <laughs> what a dummy. I don't know. How long did that last? Journalists remarked how ostensibly secular and modern people fell instantly for supernatural claims if they were proclaimed in suitably exotic style. We're still back, we're still back there, aren't we? We're still back there. And Jacob, I'm glad you love Jesus, homie. So do I, man. Yeah. A new age, more like new cringe. <laughs> more like Yanni. Dude, no. You're fired, dude. <laughs> You're fired, enslaved. You're done, homie. You're done. You can't go against Yanni. Come on, man. That dude's like taking your brain on space travels. Your heart into the craziest place. This song's about his mom, man. I mean, come on. We overstate the strength of occult ideas in California. And it's one of these things where when we think of when we think of cults, a lot of people immediately just think of California. It's a political cult at this point. It's kind of its own little prison planet. To the detriment of other Western states like Washington and New Mexico, to say nothing, of course, of Pennsylvania and <clears throat> Michigan. <laughs> I don't want to admit it, but it's true. Michigan is riddled with cults, man. It's riddled with the voodoo. It's riddled with the quackadoo. It is. Complete nonsense. Loon tunes over here. On a practical level, California law made it very easy to establish a new religious body. The process was basically open to anyone who could lay their hands on a small filing fee and produce a couple of witnesses. So you got to remember, it's like back in the day, people were like, I don't even recognize that. That's because cults took over, man. That's because enthusiasm spread, right? And it got to the point, it got to the point that enthusiasm was in the veins and verms were in the brains of Californians. It was hard to avoid it. It was spreading like wildfire. Right? Spreading like some kind of STD, right? <laughs> I'm not even going to go down that road. <laughs> right? It, it, with the Motley Crew, right? <laughs> with, with big hair metal bands. <laughs> oh. in, in whale hurts. <laughs> oh. Oh. But it's changed a lot, hasn't it? I mean, isn't it fair to say we're not, you know, that's not the same California anymore. I think it was over with Reagan. Finally, California real estate was very cheap by Eastern standards. Uh, we're back again, cuckoo world. So that a modest investment could produce an imposing temple or sanctuary with substantial grounds. Religious entrepreneurs found in the West the means, motive, and opportunity to form new sects. Furthermore, new groups faced little opposition from established churches, which throughout the 20th century were weaker in Western states than anywhere in the nation. Is that true even now? I always feel badly for all the people in the Wolfpack chat and in the comments that they're all sitting there and they're like, oh man, I'm out in California, I'm out in Portland, I'm out in Seattle, and it's just a hellscape over here. I'm like, I, I believe it. I think it's been that way probably for a long time. Scholars like Rodney Stark and William uh, Bainbridge have shown that the Far West has always 
been a largely unchurched territory. With rates of church attendance, church membership, and Orthodox religious belief well below the national average. Yeah. So they've been not doing good over there for a long time. They've been doing bad for a very, very long time. Nomine Patri, Sefili, Spiritu Sancti. Nice jacket with the headset. You remind me of some pilot. It would be even cooler, man. It'd be even cooler if I had, like, the coat with the fur. I'd wear it. <laughs> I'd, I'd be sweating like a dog, but I'd wear it. I'd wear it all year long. <laughs> I really would. I, I actually, I, I used to have a jacket like that. It was awesome. Some of the new movements, the California cults. And remember, the California cults, that's its own unique thing, actually. Because if you remember, L. Ron Hubbard in Dianetics that was right up there with the guy who could hypnotize cats. That was right up there with the, the magicians that he went to talk to, right? The folks over there with the with Kublai Khan, so or other with that, right? Descendants of Kublai Khan. He, he went and talked to some magicians, no black magicians, but he talked to other magicians, right? Their, their, their kind of tricks were not nearly as cool. But the thing is, he talked to them. And who else did he talk to? California cults. Some of the new movements contributed to the cultural and economic development of the growing city of Los Angeles. In a sense, Hollywood is built on occult foundations. Reminds me of a book, in fact, called Esoteric Hollywood. It's a good book, by the way. Right? People can disagree all day long with its author. It's a fantastic book. For people who, who like Film theory, unquestionably a good book. I It's part of my field, what I do, right? So, you know, if you're not into that sort of thing, it would be a very little value. I mean, you'd still benefit from it. But for people in my line of work, invaluable. When Aleister Crowley visited Los Angeles in 1918, he was appalled at the clamor he encountered from occult amateurs. Quote, the cinema crowd of cocaine-crazed sexual lunatics and the swarming maggots of near occultists. He didn't like them. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> cocaine-crazed sexual lunatics, swarming maggots of near occultists. <laughs> and like that last jab, he's like, I got them good. They're nearly occult. Wow, homie, you really got me there. Crowley's popularity in decadent circles received odd confirmation shortly afterward. During the investigation of the 1922 murder of director William Desmond Taylor, perhaps the biggest scandal to hit Hollywood during the silent era, a love letter providing key evidence in the case was found in Taylor's copy of Crowley's scandalous book, White Stains. 1920. Quote, We went to a fake blank church. And there was a lot of chicanery. The priests and the priestess sitting in two gold chairs with the twelve vestal virgins as the choir. Behind them was a great illuminated cross with flashing lights. During the service, the very lightly clad vestal virgins threw flowers among the audience. It was a scream. Afterward came the love feast. A virgin held a basket of bread and the audience were asked to join the holy order, which was non-sectarian, of course. Another virgin held a loving cup of wine. A loving cup of wine? What's up with that? What's up with that? A loving cup of wine. I've never met one. You look at it and you're like, don't you feel it? Don't you feel the love tonight? I do. I feel the love between me and this piece of pizza. <laughs> I got to eat more. I get distracted. By the way, after the show... After the show, I'm not eating anymore. The idea, take a bite, put it down. Take a drink, put it down. Talk. That's, that's the lesson we talked about in the Fat Shame Chat. Yeah, so they had that loving cup of wine giving you the, giving you the bat and the eyelashes. You look at that wine and you're like, oh, like, oh man, I'm having weird feelings. Why? You're just loving me like crazy. Oh my gosh, look at that. Oh. And it's like, it's like batting eyes, like giving butterfly kisses. 
It's like Indiana Jones, right? Slowly blinking its eyelids. And it says, I love you. Drink me. <laughs> yeah. Talk of hypnosis. Would you believe it? Over 150 people went forward and partook of that sacrilegious feast. Yeah. That loving cup of wine. Hypnosis. The weird fights that go on in there. Again, we're back to Blavatsky and the weird... No, you're the one that's really to blame for all of the cult of the Ascended Master. Oh, no, I don't think so. That was actually you. No, I don't think so. That's you in your face. I know you are, but what am I? Like, you're basically in Pee Wee Herman land. In the 1930s, Nathaniel West, Day of the Locust, portrayed the odd undergrowth of Hollywood sects, which preached, quote, a crazy jumble of dietary rules, economics, and biblical threats. Fictional, but plausible groups listed included the Tabernacle of the Third Coming, where a woman in male clothing preached the crusade against salt and the Temple Modern, under whose glass, <laughs> glass and chromium roof, brain breathing, the secret of the Aztecs, was taught. So you could, at this point, you could almost believe it. You're like, I think that this is fake, but, you know, it might be real. I've seen some stuff. <laughs> I've seen a lot, dude. It's in California, homie. One of the oddest California movements in an odd era was the perfect Christian divine way, which is founded as a commune. Oh, that's going to be good. <laughs> that's going to be good. Talking about the, the perfect Christian divine way, and it's a commune. Yeah, I, I think we're going to have some perfectionism happening here. Probably some antinomianism up in the house. And probably, you know, some, <laughs> some uh, activities that are mm, maybe... Adult oriented. I have a feeling. I have a feeling. Or maybe not. We'll find out. Riker's beliefs. This was uh, counted by uh, founded by William F or William E. Riker in San Francisco. That's in 1916. Riker's beliefs were an amazing mishmash of doctrines, all geared to establish the world's perfect government and to secure the racial superiority of whites and Jews. Dang, boy. <laughs> That's kind of a weird mix, too, isn't it? Isn't it a little bit? Right? That you say, oh, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> they're mixing it up on that. They're like, no, it's actually both. It's both of them. In 1919, he established Holy City in Santa Cruz Mountains, where a commune of about 30 members lived sexually segregated lives. They turned over their property to Father Riker, whose own lifestyle, of course, was, <laughs> who would have thunk it? Lavish. Dude was rolling in the loot. He was rolling in the loot. Yeah, Michael says, William James pegs New Age as the fruit of Orientalism and the cheap book industry. Right, playing on Western American desires for a non-challenging form of Christianity at the beginning of the 20th century. It would be before that. It'd be before that, but you're, you're on the money. I mean, even the, the uh, theosophists, I mean, you're, you're talking about um, integrating things, finding your way over uh, in, in foreign lands, right? In foreign lands, in India, wasn't it? In India, becoming a Buddhist, getting mixed up in that whole thing. It was actually an, an interesting documentary. I watched it today. It's got a lot of, it's got like people like just straight up propagandists. They're like, you know, I, I was very skeptical when I first started reading, but then I started realizing how could she possibly speak about so many profound things? It was remarkable, the insights and the power. And I'm like, because she's making it up. <laughs> you can talk about anything if you make stuff up. It's kind of like, you know, part of that. <laughs> What's the limit, man? What's the limit? But his lifestyle was lavish. Holy City became legendary for its garish displays, which included multiple Santa Claus statues. What? <laughs> Why? Why Santa Claus statues? What is that? And the site attracted aficionados of uh, eccentricity until its destruction by fire in 19. 19- 59. Gunter rightly added that, quote, 
the fabulous economic power of the chief crackpot groups is not always appreciated. The size of their congregations, the amount of real estate they accumulate, the number of contributors on whom they call can, in fact, be staggering. And that's the point. That's the point. Right? We're going to talk next time about cults going national, Psychiana, the silver shirts. Right? So we're going to talk about that. All right, you got all different folks, man. Is this where you talk about the I am? Yeah, the mighty I am. We're going to talk about that movement. That's pretty crazy over at Mount Shasta. Mount, Mount Shasta. Hmm. Beautiful place, by the way. Man. Yeah, Psychiana, the, the, the kind of weird mustache man stuff going on with that. And then we're caught up to the black gods, black messiahs. That's what we talked about last time. And then we'll, we'll get right back into that with voodoo. Hoodoo and voodoo, <laughs> hoodoo, voodoo, the magic island, we're going to talk about that, voodoo in America, and then of course the anti-cult campaigns will be the next episode, that's going to be 1920 to 1940, also known as the cult racket, in fact we may have actually, we may have actually talked a little bit about that, a little easy bit, we'll see, maybe not. We got a whole bunch of stuff. But the idea I want to leave you with is that last line, right? That last line there that talks about just how, just how big it had grown. How big it had grown. So right here. The fabulous economic power of the chief crackpot groups is not always appreciated. The size of their congregations the amount of their real estate they accumulate, the number of contributors on whom they call can become staggering. That was true in the early 1900s. Right? That, well, in 1947, so mid-1900s. mid, mid right? And that's, that's journalist John Gunter. He said you could pick up a copy of the Los Angeles newspaper and read the religious advertisements. They are unique. This is theology in extremists. But the idea is that it wasn't long ago that that was written. And the ideas, the ideas that were at play, the ideas that were, were prevalent at that time, they permeated. They permeated. They've affected other religions in ways that they may not even understand. Things that we do, things that we say, things that people believe, all the while, swaddling it in biblical language, swaddling it in tradition, saying, oh yeah, the church has always done this. Church has always done that. And then you go back and what do you find? Started with some, you know, wackadoodle over in the 1960s. That's what you find. It's not long ago, but yet it somehow integrated itself. It was close enough in its language, close enough in its import that it was one of those things that it was easy to, to find its way, to wiggle its way into the system. And it's that way with any enthusiasm. It's creative destruction, right? Comes in, explodes, boom, back in, boom, exploding, constantly changing, constantly adapting, constantly evolving. Seeming, seeming to die and yet always coming back to life because people are born. Because time still happens. And because the nature of sin and the role of sin in the way that we process the things that we believe and the way that we see the world, it's a subtle, crafty thing. It's subtle. It's crafty. It's easy to miss. It's easy to misdiagnose. That's why in our, our series on apologetics, when we talked about uh, the presuppositionalism, not only of St. Irenaeus, but St. Francis de Sales. In both cases, whether they were talking about the nature of error and sin in, in the worldview, in the systems, right? The hypothesis, uh, canon system complex of the unbeliever, or whether you're talking of the role of scandal and the excuses that people make for why they don't subject themselves to the truths of the church. Subtle. Subtle. And so we need to be keenly aware. 
I know it's been fun. We, we crack jokes, things like that, right? We see things that are ridiculous and we do a little ridiculing. At the same time, there ought to be a part of us that laments. There's got to be a part of us that recognizes, looking around us, that we see the effects of these terrible ideas, these terrible schemes. They're diabolical, satanic through and through. And they penetrate all around us, creeping closer and closer and closer to me and to you. And so we must be on guard. And that's why we talk about it. In fact, that's why I try to make you laugh. Because there's a lesson in that. And saying, sometimes if I just rattled off a whole bunch of fancy words at you and used isms and asians all day long and ologies and onomies and everything else, if we could do that game. It'd be hard to remember. But if you find something absurd, even, even memory specialists that say, how do, how do you remember so many names? And they say, well, you, you envision them in really crazy ways. Right? You envision them you know, in different shapes or animals with their faces on it. And you associate those names with those shapes and patterns and stuff. Because it's absurd. It's, easy for, it's easier for recall. Because I'm not just wanting you to be entertained. I hope you've had fun. But at the end of the day, I hope that you are better equipped to face a world that you is completely in the throes of all sorts of diabolical influences. Things that have built up over time, debilitating things, paralyzing things, petrifying things, terrifying things, ultimately, ultimately devastating. And not just temporally, not just in the temporal order, but eternally. And so let's not fall prey. Instead, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's, let's study, let's learn, let's read, let's laugh. And let's talk right after this. <laughs> let's talk more, you know, like right now. Because right now, we are going to be going over to the Wolfpack chat. So if you're still awake, right now, it's 1122. Did pretty good today. It's an hour and 18 minutes, not too shabby, right? Feeling pretty good, feeling pretty good. Over right now, if you go in the, in the description below, right now, you are going to see the the uh, URL, the link for the Wolfpack chat on Telegram. It's an app. It's completely free. Okay, you don't need to pay anything for that, and it's awesome. There's tons of amazing people. We have a prayer chain there. We have a, a book club of the Canine Brigade going through the Catholic Controversy: A Defense of the Faith by Francis de Sales. If you have missed that series that I did, that's available in a playlist, which is also down below. And it's on, it's on Telegram. All of these things are. Our enthusiasm playlist. The manuals for young men and young women. The apologetics of everyday life of Father Lassant. Right? All of those things on, on Catholic obedience. On secular age. How did we get here? From a religious paradigm? From, from the paradigm of politics and philosophy and technics? How did we get to this place? What is this? What are we up against? Because if we understand it, we will be more effective, not only in protecting ourselves, but adequately finding those places, that jugular that we've got to go for, right? Those roots that we must reach down deep to uproot. They're shallower than you think. They're shallower than you think. And we equipped you in the series, the, the series on Catholic presuppositionalism, a groundbreaking series talking about St. Irenaeus, talking about St. Francis de Sales, the cells versus the set of a contest. Tons of great stuff. All down. Go to the description below. And until next time, never give up. Keep on smiling. And momento more. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.